Okay, if we have our Bibles tonight and we'd open them to, to uh, Romans, the 14th chapter. This is more of a, a Bible study than a sermon tonight. Romans, the 14th chapter, and I want to begin at verse 12. Romans 14, beginning at verse 12. And standing in honor of the reading of God's Word. And tonight I use the New King James text, which is a little bit easier to understand. So that each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love, do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace, and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever, listen to this last part of the scripture, very important. For whatever is not from faith is sin. You've heard me talk about the fact that all sin has its roots in unbelief. That's where it comes from right here. For whatever is not from faith is sin. If it's not born of faith, it is then therefore sin. It is unbelief. It has its roots in unbelief. Master, we thank you today for your word. We thank you, God, for this morning service. Yes, We're grateful, Lord, for this opportunity again to be in the house of God, to hear from you. Yes. Lord Jesus, we ask now that your presence and your anointing would help your messenger, God, to extract from your word the important principles that we need to know and understand today for the edification of our souls, for the building up of our faith. God, help us today to serve you better, to love you more, for we ask it in none other than the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You may be seated tonight. <clears throat> you know, Paul in the 14th chapter of the book of Romans starts out with a wonderful <clears throat> principle in the 12th verse, and that principle is simply this, so that each of us shall give account of himself to God. I'm not going to answer for you. You're not going to answer for me. Right. You know, if more people would get this in their head, there would be less turmoil in the church, and the devil wouldn't have a heyday yeah. with people judging one another and condemning one another and criticizing one another right. because we'd all understand that when this whole thing is said and done, when it's all finished, each of us shall give account of himself right. to God. I'm going to answer.
answer to God for my issues. You're going to answer to God for your issues. And never the twain shall meet. Amen. You know, your issues aren't mine, mine aren't yours, but that's okay. Because like the old song says, we'll talk it over in the by and by. We'll talk it over, my Lord and I. I'll ask the reasons. He'll tell me why when we talk it over in the by and by. Amen. Each of us is responsible to God for ourselves. This is why I, I constantly say in our church that uh, it's imperative that you understand in an affirming church, it is not about... Do I necessarily agree with everything that everybody around me does? Do I agree with the way this person lives their life or the way they uh, do things? It, that's not important. What's important in the church of Jesus Christ is that each individual in the pew, as well as the guy in the pulpit, uh, be concerned first about their own salvation. Amen. 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 The Bible says. Now, if you see your brother is believing wrong, if you see that their, their belief system is somehow convoluted and it's not quite right, then the Bible speaks of helping them to understand the truth so that if they're in an error, if they're in a, a false mindset or a false doctrine, it's important then to help them to understand the truth. But if the way they're doing things or if the way they're living their life isn't quite up to snuff for you, it's not your business to fix them. Amen. It's not our job to somehow repair them. That God has not called us to this. Paul says in verse 13 of chapter 14 of Romans, Therefore let us not judge one another anymore. Amen. Now that's pretty plain and simple, isn't it? Right. Amen. Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged, for with the same judgment that you right. judge, you will be judged. And Paul is telling us also, again, don't judge. It's not your job to be the judge. Amen. He said, but rather resolve this, make a commitment to this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Amen. This is one reason why I... I say to folks, hey, you know what? If you engage in certain activities and you know that those activities are not condoned by the church, they're not the kind of thing we preach and that we encourage, you might say, that I don't care what you do as long as you don't brag about it. Right, amen. You know, as long as you don't come into the house of God and brag about what you do, because if you come in... Somebody who is very weak may hear you, and they may be very discouraged by, well, I, you know, I can't believe that that man calls himself a Christian, and he acts that way, and I can't believe. We had a fellow coming to church several months back, a year or so ago, and you'd know who I was talking about if I said his name, but I won't. Yeah. And he sat there one day and bragged about the fact that out of all the people in the church that day, he would slept with about half of them. And I was appalled by that statement. It was an entirely inappropriate statement. Amen. The Bible says that not only should we not judge one another, but we should have a certain resolve. And that resolve is that we not put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. You know, we've got to be careful what we say and how we say it. Because there are those among us who are going to be offended and turned off by the things that we say or the way that we say them. And we've got to be so careful sometimes because if there's any one thing we should be resolved to, it is not to want to be a stumbling block or not to want to be the cause for falling in somebody else's experience with God. Amen. And uh, I think a lot of times people are careless in this, and I don't think they put enough thought into this. Uh, when they're dealing with other children of God and other saints, they don't think about the fact that what they're saying or how they say it. You know, a lot of times Grandma Bell can mean well. And I know she means well. I know she's not trying to be, you know, discouraging or she's not trying to be. But the way she'll say something. I just spiritually, in the spirit, I'll just see that person she's talking to falling right over the words that yeah. she's laid down in front of them like a yeah. brick. Yeah. And I think, God, that's a stumbling block. You know, you can't say something like that to somebody. Yeah. You've got to be careful about
about using that kind of phraseology and that sort of terminology. I kind of got a kick out of our conversation with Aunt Dorothy the other day. And the reason that I did was because I'm sitting there and I'm listening to what she's saying, and it's not a matter of agree or disagree with her, but it was a matter of, Aunt Dot, look at who you're talking to. Some of us have been in the very position that you're talking about. And understanding that, you would think that she might have enough sense to realize Maybe it isn't wise for me to say this this way. Maybe it isn't appropriate for me to say this right now. Because, you know, it's, it's all well and good to discuss what you see as or perceive as being the, the loosening up of the church. You know, how the church is loosening up on things. But at the same time, you don't know always. Now, in her instance, she should have known the experience of all of us that were in the room. But at the same time, you don't always know everybody's experience. And you've got to be very careful what you say and how you say it. What if we had brought somebody with us and that person was sitting there and they were in the very situation that Aunt Dorothy was talking about. Unmarried couples that come to church and you know, and they're sitting there like they're just as good as everybody else and blah, blah, blah. And it used to be a time when you'd be embarrassed and ashamed to come into the church if you weren't married and you were living together and blah, blah, blah. And I understood what she was saying in principle. I understood what she was saying. Uh, to some degree, I agreed. To some degree, I didn't. Right. Amen. But the point of the matter is you've got to be careful. Because your words can become a stumbling block. What if somebody heard you say that and they were someone who was indeed living with someone outside of uh, marriage and they decided, well, based on what Dorothy Overton said, I have no right to go into the house of God. I should be ashamed of myself. I'm not even going to bother going anymore. I remember some years ago, and it's, it's been quite a while now, I used to visit the First United Pentecostal Church in, in Staten Island quite a bit. The pastor there was Pastor Carter. He was a real sweet fellow. I liked him a lot. He and his wife were real sweet people. We used to use their baptistry whenever we needed to baptize folks. And uh, he and there was another church in Brooklyn we used to use as well. But uh, Brother Carter was a good fellow. And I've told you the story about the lady who came to me after a church service and said, Sir, can you help me? And she began to explain some situations that she was going through, and it became obvious in very short order that this woman was demon-possessed. And I've told you the story about how I began to, to uh, first of all, I asked the pastor for his permission to minister to her. But then as I began to minister to her, how the, the spirit within her would throw her right to the ground and she looked like she was slain in the spirit and I knew better I knew that was a distraction I knew the devil was trying to throw me off track and I'd take her by the hand and say you old devil in the name of Jesus stand up and as I did that I told you she sprung up on her feet like there was a spring in her back yeah. <laughs> well that same lady when she came into the church that night she was a woman in her early Late 30s, early 40s, I forget now exactly how old she was. And she had been living with a young man who wasn't but 19 years old. She was a lot older than he. Now, I don't believe, and I want to make this clear, I don't believe that's a sin in and of itself. I don't want to make it sound like just because, you know, somebody's with a person that's much younger than them, that somehow that's a big sin. No, that's not a big sin. That's not the point. But the point in this particular circumstance, God revealed to me as I was speaking to her after the service and after she had gotten her deliverance and her home was needing to be delivered from influences, spiritual influences, which had come into her home as well. And I made arrangements to go out there with Jason and do that on the Thursday following that Sunday. And as I was speaking with her, though, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, 
she knows that she's really just using this young man. She knows that she's not in love with this person. She knows that she's just using him for a variety of reasons and in a variety of ways. And that relationship, this relationship, not every, you know, May, December, however they call it, relationship, not every one of those would be wrong or improper, but this relationship was improper. And the Lord said to me, tell her if she wants her home to be delivered in the same way that her uh, body was delivered tonight from those kind of demonic influences, she needs to obey the voice of God. And tonight the voice of God would say to her, uh, sister, you need to move that fella out. You know he's not the one for you. You know he's not the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. If he was, you'd be married by now, and you're not. And you know that the relationship as it stands is not appropriate. And sometimes God will put conditions on miracles like he did with uh, Naaman, the leper. When he said, go and dip yourself in the Jordan seven times. Sometimes God will put a condition on a miracle or on a blessing. And so I told her, I said, there's a condition here. If you want your home to be delivered, God wants you to let that boy go free. Let him uh, be to himself. Let him be able to pursue a relationship that's more healthy, that's more appropriate. And at the same time, uh, you need to be in a place where you're free to pursue a relationship that's more appropriate and more healthy. Amen. Well, when I went to that lady's house on Thursday, he had moved out. She did exactly what the man of God asked her to do. That's the way people ought to behave. That's the way you ought to conduct yourself. When the, when the word of God comes to you and somebody helps you to understand the right way to go and the right thing to do, you need to do it. It's that easy. But you see, here's where I'm going with that point. If that young lady had been sitting in an environment where she heard somebody talking about how inappropriate and how wrong it was for someone who's living with someone outside of marriage to come to church and to be in the house of God and to hold their head up high, she might have been discouraged right out of even trying to come to church. She might have been discouraged right out of trying to be in the house of God. And in the process of that, she would have never gotten her deliverance. She would have never gotten a word from the Lord. She would have never rectified the situation. Amen. Right. So you see, sometimes we've got to let the sinner be. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we've got to let folks be until God can deal with the situation in his time and in his way. And when you have been under the direct influence of demonic spirits for a number of years like this lady did, and all of a sudden you're delivered, and you feel like a weight has been lifted off of you, and then the very man of God who casts those demons out of you says to you, hey, this relationship isn't right. You really need to change this situation. Then you're in a position to hear and obey because you know this person is speaking from a place of power with God and authority. That's right, amen. But if you're just hearing a saint in the church sitting and judgmentally and critically suggesting that you have no place in the house of God, then how dare you come to church and just hold your head up? Oh, my Lord. Amen. That's right. Then we become a rock of offense and a stumbling block. And that scares me. And I wish people would be so much more careful with their words. I wish they'd be so much more careful in what they say and how they say it. Because you'd be amazed how easily somebody, sometimes, and I'm guilty of this myself, and I try to watch it as much as I'm able. I love to flirt. Anybody who knows me knows I love to flirt. I do it harmlessly. I do it, you know, I, I do it without really thinking about it. I'm just being a goof, and I'm just, I'm not trying to, uh, there's no... Uh, truthfulness in what I'm doing or saying. I'm not trying to get with somebody, if I can use that term. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, get in somebody's bed or whatever the case might be. Uh, I'm just being flirtatious. I guess as an older guy, I'm getting to the point in my life where it's kind of flattering to me when I'm flirtatious with somebody and they take it in good humor and good spirits. It, it kind of flatters me. 
And uh, so that, I think, is really why I do it. I just, I appreciate it so much when I flirt with that young waitress, you know, and she acts like she's almost uh, flattered by it. You know, it makes this old boy feel good that that young lady would actually act flattered rather than offended or, or turned off by my flirtation, you know. But there are times when I'm sensitive to the voice of the Holy Ghost, and I know better, don't do that. Yes. Not for this one. Yes, amen. Because that person may be coming from a place, or they may be coming from a situation where a man uh, being flirtatious with her in that way would make her do nothing but look and say, well, that old dirty preacher, look at him flirting with me. Yes. You know, he, he shouldn't be acting like that, blah, blah, blah. Because he, she wouldn't, or he wouldn't, whatever, wouldn't receive it in the spirit that I was intending it. Right, yeah. And there are many times that I'm, I'm sensitive to the voice of God, and I know, not this time. Right, amen. And you'll notice that there are times that I'll just act as normal and as plain with certain people as I do any, you know, and, you know. Yes, amen. But then there are other times I'll be very flirtatious and kind of yeah. kidding around with somebody, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think it's imperative because Paul tells us that we ought to be resolved not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I think it's imperative that we learn to be sensitive to the leading of God's Spirit so that we don't say the wrong thing in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. And we not wind up becoming a cause for stumbling to somebody. But listen to what Paul says in verse 14 of chapter 14, the book of Romans. I know, now you've heard me preach on this in the past about I know. Yes, yes. I know and am convinced, Paul says, by the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is saying that it's the Lord himself who has convinced him of this Amen, fact. That's right. That there is nothing... N-O-T-H-I-N-G, nothing yes. unclean of itself. Amen. Nothing. Amen. Nothing. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is, it is unclean. Amen. You have a problem with a certain sexual orientation? Well then, brother, don't you be crawling into bed with another man. And woman, don't be crawling into bed with another woman. Because you believe that to be wrong and inappropriate and sinful. Therefore, you should not do it. Amen. 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 But if you're somebody who you feel that that is your natural inclination and that is your natural uh, orientation and you have not chosen it, you have not... Uh, right. desired it. It is simply you woke up and that is how you felt. Right. And if you do not feel condemned in that and you want to come to church and worship God and serve Him, sweetheart, you're welcome here. That's right. Amen. 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 Because it's not about, you know, we love to define everything as yes. sin. Amen. We love to define everything as black and white. We love to put everything in tight little packages and be able to say, this is right and that is wrong. This is right and that is wrong. This is right and that is wrong. But Paul teaches us in Romans 14, this may be right for you, but it's wrong for him. Yes. This right. may be okay with you, but it's not for him. Right. This may be wrong for you, but it's all right with him. Amen. Because it's not all black and white. There are shades of gray. Yes, amen. There are areas where uh, what is appropriate for me may not be appropriate for you. I may be able to drink a glass of wine with my dinner, and you may be a person who's prone to an alcoholic disposition, and you're not able. That's right, amen. One drink of that wine, and you're right back in the gutter. You're right back in the old pattern, because your body and your mind are predispositioned toward alcoholism. You know, Uncle Eddie, bless his heart, he can't have a glass of beer. He can't have a glass of wine because he knows that one glass and that's all it would take. That's right, amen. And so for the last 20 years or so now, he's avoided it at all costs. Now, if you want to drink it, that's all right with him. He could care less. He can go to a wedding and watch everybody around him drink. But he knows for him, I can't touch it. I can't have it. It's, it may be pleasurable to you, but it's poison to me. Amen. That's right. And there are a lot of things in the church that we love to define as black and white, 
And God says, no, what may be pleasurable to you is poison to that one. And at the same time, what may be poison to you is pleasant to the other. And we get so caught up in condemning and judging one another. But Paul said, let's not do that. Paul goes on to say, yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. You know, the Bible tells us Jesus' teaching said, it is not what goes into a man that defiles a man, but rather what comes out. And yet there are so many people who are so busy looking at what we put in. And they're so busy looking at the intake rather than the output, if I can say it that way. And it is amazing to me because, you know, we got so many people, like we said with Judy the other day at the restaurant. You know, there are so many politicians in our world today and so many preachers who are so concerned about what goes on in everybody else's bedroom and what they're doing. Honey, what they put in where and how they do it doesn't matter to nobody but them. That's not your business. It's not what goes into a man that defiles him. It's what comes out of him. But do you look and do you watch and do you listen to what comes out of that person? Do you watch and do you listen to what they say? Do you watch and do you listen to what they do? They're a compassionate person who helps those that are in great need. I was looking at a website the other day and I was amazed. I was very pleased to see that there was a rainbow hurricane fund that had been established. And this was set up by the GLBT community in order to assist people who had been affected by the hurricane in Louisiana and in Mississippi and in Alabama. And I thought that it was wonderful because I said, see, this community puts out a lot of good stuff. This community tries desperately to put out a lot of good stuff. It's not all about what goes in. It's about what comes out that defiles a man. Amen. That's right. You know, you meet somebody and all they ever do is curse and cuss and carry on and and say nasty things about people and criticize people and judge people. Well, my God Almighty, you can tell that that person is defiled by what comes out of them. That's right. Amen. But then you meet someone whose lifestyle you don't agree with. I say lifestyle. I hate that term, lifestyle. Yes, right. But let's use it for the moment anyway. You don't agree with their lifestyle, the way they live their life, and yet there's so much positive and so much good that comes out of them. That's right. Yes. Maybe they're a believer. Maybe they are trusting God for their salvation. Maybe they are forever and always giving God the praise for good things that come into their lives. Maybe they are forever and always going to church and offering the Lord the glory. Maybe they are constantly and always saying positive things and good things and trying to encourage people and trying to help people. And when somebody comes to them with a need, they minister to that need. Why can you not see what's coming out? That's right. They don't want to see it. Amen. Why are you focusing on what's going in? That's right. Why are you so concerned about what goes on in private? That's right. Amen. It's not your business. Amen. What a person eats is not your business. What they put in their mouth to eat is not your business. Neither what they do in their bedroom is any of your business. Amen. So we've got to understand tonight that Paul is telling us in Romans 14, there is nothing unclean unto itself. Nothing. Nothing. That's a big word because it encompasses everything. Amen. Amen. And then the Lord of the Lord, then Paul turns around and says in verse 16, therefore do not let your good be spoken of as evil. Amen. <laughs> We just love to label people as evil. That's right. Even though they live a good life. That's right. Amen. Even though they do good. Even though they strive to follow after good. We still label them as evil. That's right. 
And why do we label them as evil? For the things that they put in, for the things that they do, which we really have no say in to begin with, or which is none of our business from the get-go. And Paul said, let not your good be spoken of as evil. And that's one reason why sometimes if you think it's okay to behave the way you behave, but you know that there are some who may look upon it questionably and some who may look upon it uh, with a certain disdain or, or disgust even, yeah. then it's wise to keep your mouth shut. Amen. Like that individual used to come to our church and bragged about how many people he'd slept with, you know. That was inappropriate. There was no need to say that. You know that the average Christian is not going to look upon such a statement with a positive attitude. Right, amen. So therefore, why in the world would you even say it? That was just a dumb thing to do. Amen. And in doing so, you provide an opportunity for the devil to use your words to become a stumbling block in front of somebody else. Right, amen. Well, if he's going to church and acting like that, I don't want to go to that church. You know, we read in Paul's writings, <clears throat> I believe it's 1 Corinthians 5, where he writes to the church and talks about the fact that there is a man in the church who is hooked up with his father's wife. Yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is, as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. He says, and you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For indeed, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, I have already judged, as though I were present, concerning him who has so done this deed. In the name of, the, of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Amen. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? That's right. Therefore purge out the leaven that ye may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. When you look at the King James text, you understand that one of the biggest problems that Paul had with this situation was the fact that this man bragged about what he had done. Yes, he, he bragged about the fact that, well, uh, she used to be my father's wife, but I was able to, you know, he, he must have had some sort of a issue with his dad, and yes. somehow or another, he must have felt real good about himself that he was able to steal away his father's wife. Now, we don't know whether this was a first wife or a second wife. We don't know whether the father was widowed and this was a second marriage. Right. We don't know whether the father was divorced and this was a second marriage. We certainly don't know whether this was the actual mother to the actual boy, which would really right. be scary. Yeah. Amen. But Paul says here, you know, that there is such immorality that it's never even named amongst the Gentiles. He said this sort of thing isn't even heard about in the most ungodly of circles. Amen, that's right. But the fact that the church, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 5, that they actually were celebrating this man's activity. That's what I mean about the individual sat there and bragged what, about what he bragged about. That was not something to celebrate. That was not something to brag about. It was not appropriate. Amen. Most certainly in the presence of God's people and in the company of God's church, you don't talk about and brag about these kind of things. It's entirely inappropriate. If this man had done what he did and then kept it quiet and kept it to himself, Amen. if he felt that he was justified 
in it and he was appropriate in it, all well and good. But when you start to make an issue of it and brag about it as though you've done some great thing, and you know that other people are looking and saying, good grief, I haven't even heard of such a thing in all my life. I've never heard of such conduct. I've never heard of such behavior. Amen. Then you become a stumbling block and a cause for occasion for falling for somebody. Amen. The word of God goes on to tell us tonight, for the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness. And you've heard me talk about that, doing right. right. And peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. If you are doing right, and you feel in your spirit that you are doing right between you and God, then you have peace. There's no conflict. When we don't do right, we know that our inner voice and our conscience tends to tell us something that right here, That's right, amen. you know you're not acting right, you know you're not doing right, and your inner voice, and your peace is disturbed. You don't have that peace. And you don't have that joy that you would normally have. Amen. Because when you step out of the right, when you step out of righteousness, then our, our own spirit, the word of God tells us, condemns us. That's right, amen. Our own spirit. God doesn't condemn us. Our own spirit condemns us. Talking with Aunt Dorothy the other day, she mentioned something about, I can't quite remember what it was now, but she mentioned that she felt like she was under conviction. She felt bad about this certain thing she had done or whatever the case might be. And I remembered years ago at the Riverside Church of God, Sister Mimi Stallings, who I love dearly, a sweet old-time holiness lady, but she mentioned one day in a testimony how that as a young girl she had put on a pair of overalls and gone out into the field to work on the cotton. She was from North Carolina or something like that originally. <clears throat> and I believe they were picking cotton. And she said she got out into that field and all of a sudden she said she heard the voice of God ask her, what are you doing? What are you wearing? And she said, listen to this, Lord, if you'll let me live long enough to get back to the house, I'll never put on a pair of pants so long as I live. You see how severely she interpreted what she was hearing? And I'm not even going to begin to try to figure out what she was hearing or where it was coming from. But the point of the matter is, you hear how severely she interpreted those words? Yeah. As if God was on the ready to strike her dead for wearing a pair of overalls into a field to work in the dirt and in the cotton and all. Sometimes I think a lot of people experience condemnation and guilt and quote-unquote conviction. And I'm not at all certain that it comes from God. Bible said, if you feel that it is wrong, then don't do it. That's right. And the Bible tells us that our own spirit, if your own spirit condemn you, Paul said, That's right. then you're condemned. That's right. Because you do better than to do it. If your own spirit tells you you're doing the wrong thing, then you know you're doing the wrong thing for you. Now, if you've become convinced you're going to a church and they preach that you're supposed to wear dresses all the time and blah, 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 and you've become convinced of that and you believe that to be true, then you need to do that. That's right. Amen. Until you become convinced otherwise. Amen. Until you feel a release from that dogma or that doctrine, you need to adhere to it because you've become convinced of it, and therefore if you go against it, God isn't going to strike you dead, but your own spirit will condemn you. Amen. That's for sure. Because you're living in contradiction. You're not doing what you know to do according to the teaching of your particular church or whatever, you know, part, group or whatever you're a part of. It's not that God is standing at the ready to condemn or judge us. It's a matter of we need to be understanding that many times our own heart will condemn us. 
The Bible goes on to tell us, For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. In what things? In righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It says, For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved of men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. When somebody brags about how many people they've slept with and blah, 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 how does that edify anybody? It doesn't. That doesn't lift anybody up. That doesn't encourage anybody. That doesn't help anybody in their Christian walk. And therefore, it doesn't need to be said. It is not appropriate. It has the potential for causing harm, but it has no potential for bringing help. And if it doesn't bring help, then it most certainly is not going, it, the potential exists that it's going to cause harm, and we don't need it. Amen. We don't need it in the church. The Word of God goes on to tell us, verse 20, Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Paul said, yes, there's no doubt that everything is pure. But at the same time, if it is a matter of, if it is a matter of destroying the work of God because of your liberty, then for heaven's sakes, curb your liberty. Amen. Brother Tatlock used to say, and I always got a kick out of this, he said, if by doing a certain thing I offend my brother, then I'll not do it. That's right. As long as he's looking. <laughs> That's what Brother Tatlock said. He said, as long as he's looking, I won't do it. That's right. Amen. But when he's not around, if I'm comfortable eating ham and he doesn't think that I should eat pork, well, that's his business, but when I'm at home having breakfast in the privacy of my own home, I'm going to have ham, Amen. or I'm going to have bacon, or I'm going to have sausage. I'm going to have whatever I want to have. Amen. But when I'm near that brother and I know that he is offended by a certain thing and he's troubled by a certain thing, then I most certainly, for his sake, will abstain. Amen. It's that simple. It's a simple principle tonight. It's all about keeping others in mind. You know, we don't live unto ourselves as children of God. But Paul said, all things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Meaning that he is offending somebody in the process of eating. He says, it is good neither to eat meat, nor to drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended, or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Amen. Happy is he who does not condemn himself. Happy is he who does not condemn himself. It's not about God condemning you. It's about you condemning yourself. Amen. That's right. In what he approves. That's right. So if you feel liberty, and if you feel that a certain activity or a certain food or whatever is approved of God for you and you feel comfortable doing it, Paul says, wonderful. It's great that you have that faith and that confidence and that you've worked it out with God. He said, but have it to yourself before God. Amen. Amen. Because happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. Amen. So if you're sitting there saying, I'm really not sure if I should even be eating this. I remember I was invited some years ago to a friend's house in New York City. His family was Hindu. And they had a festival. He told me it was a festival. A festival of lights, they called it. And he invited me to come. He said, for us, it's very much like Christmas. It's a big holiday, a big thing, you know. Yeah. And they have all these special foods and all this sort of thing. And he invited me to come over, and I said, well, I suppose it would be okay. 
And I went to his house, and his parents had made this big feast, and all the foods are vegetarian that they make, <coughs> because they're Hindu. And all the foods were vegetarian, and all the foods, you know, were of a certain nature. But I noticed in their home that they were burning incense before a, an idol in their home. They had a little statue of this Hindu god, you know. And they were burning incense in front of it. And they had money and stuff put in front of it. They were giving offerings to this. And as I sat there, I began to get very sick to my stomach. And in my spirit, I felt like this is inappropriate. Because what they're doing is, this is all a part of their worship and veneration of this God, and yeah. I can't participate in that. I cannot participate in this idolatry. Yes. That would be inappropriate for me. Yes. Now, maybe somebody else could have gone in there and said, well, I don't feel condemned in it. It doesn't bother me. I, I know I don't worship this idol. I know I don't believe like they believe. I know blah, 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 blah. That's all well and good. But you know what? In my spirit, that's how I felt. Yeah. And for me to have stayed there and eaten and, and uh, participated in their uh, activity and their holiday, it would have been wrong for me. Right. Now, I'm not going to get up here and preach to you, this is what you must do if you come into this kind of a situation. No, it's up to you and God. But I know for me, my heart said, this is not right, this is inappropriate, and I excused myself and I left. And bought a hamburger down at McDonald's. <laughs> but you see, you know, instead of standing there and trying to uh, create a law and legalize everything, right. no, it's not an across-the-board matter. I know that for me, I was uncomfortable. And for that reason, I knew that I can't do this. Because if I do it when I don't feel right about it, then I'm not acting in faith. And if I'm not acting in faith, what did Paul said? Anything that is not of faith is sin. Amen. I would have been doing wrong. Yes, simply by reason of the fact that I would be going against my internal mechanism, which helps me to know right from wrong, the tape just ended. Amen. Amen. Yes. So I've done my 45 minutes. Okay. <laughs> but he who doubts is condemned if he eats. Because he does not eat from faith. Why? For whatever is not from faith is sin. You know, we talked about a situation the other day uh, at Aunt Dots when we were discussing and I talked about Jason and yes, yes, how I was yes. questioning and I was uncertain about yes. certain things. Uh -huh. And see, at that time, I had to refrain and abstain from certain things because I was unsure. That's right, amen. And if I couldn't do it knowing in my heart that all was well, I would have been acting in sin. That's right. That's right. Amen. Not because the activity in and of itself is sin, but because I was uncertain of it. Yeah, that's right. And my own heart questioned and I wasn't sure it was the right thing. And until I could be sure I had no right nor any place to do it. That's right. Amen. And it's a simple matter. Serving God is a simple matter. God places conscience within us. And the Holy Spirit helps to lead us. The Bible said he will lead us and guide us into all truth. And it's really a simple matter. If there is something on the inside that says this isn't a good idea. This is not the right thing to do. Amen. Well, Mother, for you and I, at that moment in time, it's not the right thing to do. One thing, and I'm closing with this comment now. One thing that always cracks me up is when people say, well, if it was sin 30 years ago, it's sin today. That's right. No, it's actually not true. That's right. It's not true. It may have been imp in improper, inappropriate, wrong for you 30 years ago. But you know what? People change. Things change, situations change, we grow, we develop, and as you grow and as you mature, like for instance, I hate to use her as an example, and I hope she never sees this tape because I don't want to offend her, but you know, my dear Aunt Dorothy, 30 years ago, she didn't ever put on a pair of pants. 30 years ago, to her, that would have been the most grievous of sins. 
But you know what? Today she wears pants to work. She wears them out in public. She goes, when it's cold outside, she wants to wear pants instead of a dress. She wears pants. But 30 years ago, she thought that was the greatest horrible thing she could have possibly done. Well, what, what happened to the statement you just made? If it's sin 30 years ago, it's sin today. What happened to that? How come you only apply it to those areas where, where you feel it's comfortable applying it? Mm -hmm. To those who are unwed and come to the house of God and they're not married but they're living together. Oh, you, you're willing to apply that concept to them, but you're not willing to apply it to yourself. If it was sin 30 years ago to live together as married, even though you were unmarried, then according to you, it's sin today. But if that's true, then the same sense true of wearing pants. If it was sin 30 years ago, then it's still sin today. Amen. That's right. But see, you have evolved. You have developed. You have come to a place in your mind and in your heart where you've become convinced that wearing pants is not a mortal sin. Right. It's not going to condemn your soul to hell. And therefore, having come to that place of understanding, you're able now to experience a liberty that you didn't have 30 years ago. You're able to do something that you didn't feel comfortable doing 30 years ago. Amen. Does it mean that God has changed? No, God's the same. That's right. But we've changed. Yes, amen. We've come to realize something that we didn't realize before. We've come to understand something that we did not understand before. And in the process of that, we grow and we evolve and we develop and we mature. And that's why the Bible says, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven, which is perfect. It doesn't mean be without any faults or without any uh, sin or without any... That's not what God is saying. He says, mature, be mature, grow up. In the process of your Christian walk, mature. Come to a place of maturity. And in the process of maturing, a lot of your perception of things will change. And as your perception of things changes, so then change those things which we perceive for ourselves Amen. to be sin. Amen. It doesn't change God, but it just means that we've evolved and we've come up a little bit higher in God and come to understand that things are not what we perceived them to be so many years ago. Amen. Amen. But if we went against what we thought 30 years ago, and if we had gone against that 30 years ago, when we believed in our heart that it was a certain way at that time, then we would have been acting in sin because we were acting in unbelief. Right. Amen. Amen. Okay, would you stand with me? We're all done. Just a little Bible study tonight on Romans chapter 14. <clears throat> Master, we thank you, God, for this evening. We thank you, God, for your word. We're grateful tonight, God, that we are not condemned by anything any activity, Master, any food, but rather, God, we stand before you pure and holy, and the only thing, God, that would condemn us is our own heart. For, Lord, if we feel in our spirit that it is inappropriate to do or say or, or eat any particular thing, then it's inappropriate for that time. That doesn't mean that it will necessarily always be inappropriate for us, but for that specific moment in time, it is indeed inappropriate and wrong because we'd be acting in unbelief. God, help us tonight to take this word with us. Help us to understand these principles and to apply them to every portion of our lives and every corner of our heart. God, help us to walk before you in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For Master, tonight that is our desire. Help us, Lord, not to be a stumbling block to our neighbor, to our friends, to our fellow believers, but rather, God, let everything we say and do be an encouragement to them. And let it be an exhortation for them to do the right thing and to live right, to walk right. Amen. Master, tonight we ask, God, that you'd lift us up to a higher place than we've ever before known in you. For we ask it, God, in none other than the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. Praise God and amen. We're dismissed tonight in the name of the Lord. Go in peace. Do you really want to? Uh, yeah.